job, Doug. Praise the Lord. Great job. Well, praise the Lord in this house today. I said, praise the Lord in this house today. I said, praise the Lord in this house today. <laughs> my, my, my. What a wonderful presence of God today. What a wonderful presence of God in this house this day. In the name of Jesus. If you're from Sussex County, it just gets gooder and gooder. <laughs> Yeah, we don't do better and better. We do gooder and gooder. Thank you, Jesus. But that's just here in Sussex County. I don't know what they do anywhere else. Of course, you know where, where we're located, we're so blessed of the Lord because we, we're not really part of America. We just live close to it. We just keep on going. Amen. <laughs> but I thank God for America, and I thank God that I was born in America. And every person that's ever been born of America or has came here and given an opportunity to be successful ought to bless God every day that they're here in this great, wonderful land God has blessed us with. I want to I go back on, on 2 Samuel uh, chapter 23. Now, if you haven't been here for the last two weeks, this is my third week into this uh, particular uh, part of the Bible. But you're not going to miss anything, and you can certainly go back on YouTube or Facebook, and you can catch uh, all the rest of them. But this psalm, in which is actually not in the book of Psalms, it's in 2 Samuel chapter 22. Now, the Bible is not in quite a chronological order, and David's story goes on much farther past 2 Samuel. But this is actually what, the, what theological uh, scholars call was the last song of David. But I had renamed it, and I'll show you, if you will, the Everlasting Song of David, because this song was not something David conjured up in his mind. It came from his spiritual being, given to him by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he jotted down all of these words, which contended to one thing, that in the days that we live in, I will tell you something, you can draw great strength and great wisdom and great encouragement from the book of Psalms, because David's Psalms in particular, in which he wrote probably three-quarters of them, there's some in there by Moses, there's some in there by some of the musicians, there's some in there by some who's, who's completely unknown. But either it doesn't make either or, because it's all the Word of God. And, and I will encourage you uh, to begin to study that book of Psalms, and start in verse 1, and just be, or chapter 1, and just begin to read through the book of Psalms. And I will guarantee you, you will not go very deep into the book of Psalms, that you will not be encouraged, even with all the madness and the chaos that's going on around us. Now, this madness and chaos in which that we have encountered, and, and, uh, and it's been progressing, uh, you know, uh, to my opinion, we, we had uh, four better years than we're having at this time in history. And, uh, and it's all because of choices what we make. But now, in saying that, I want you to understand something about our electoral system that, Eve, that came from God himself. Uh, God has always intended for man to be able to pick a governed body to govern over them. But our forefathers in the Constitution, and this is what holds our country together, I will tell you something, if they ever figure out a way to get rid of this, the next step will be get rid of this. And that's what they're after, and that's what they're trying to get a hold of. But that's never going to happen as long as the church is here. Uh, it, it may happen after the rapture takes place because it's going to go chaotic anyway. But our forefathers had, were geniuses, and when uh, God gave them uh, the words for this little book for us to be governed by, he always intended for us to elect people who had some godly mind with them. Well, unfortunately, not many of them have a godly mind anymore. They're more concerned about whether they can get money and votes than they can whether they're going to govern a country accordingly uh, to the plan of God. I will tell you something right now. Had this nation, and of course now, in saying that, it's wishful thinking because you have to understand the second side of this coin. The second side of this coin is, is that the entire world will get to a place of just catastrophic chaos. The church will be taken out of here, hopefully any day, and the Antichrist will have a platform to step out on. What happened in the last eight months really boggles my mind. 
because prior to that, we didn't have any problem with shipping. We didn't have any problem with food on the table. We didn't have any problem, you know, we just kind of meandered along there. But now all of a sudden, we got all of these interruptions. We can't get a new car. In America, we can't build a new car. What in the world is going on? How did this happen? And the only answer that I can come up to, it's a plan of God. It's a plan of God, number one, not to get the world's attention at this moment. No, sir. It is to get the church's attention. It is to get the individual Christian back on track, back committed, back doing the things of God, back desiring the things of God. You know, the average church doesn't desire the things of God. They desire the things of man. And that's why they're loaded up with all kind of earthly programs. Programs from babies to 80s. Church has got something going on every night. But very little of it has anything to do with the preaching of the Word of God. It has everything to do with pleasing the flesh, tantalizing the flesh. God's bringing us to a place where we got doctors that are quitting, nurses that are walking off the job, those that, are, that, that, that can retire are retiring. We're coming to a crippled medical system to where you can't get an operation when you need one. Just look past on the last year and a half. The amount of patients, of cancer patients that died because they weren't allowed to go to the hospital to get their treatment because of COVID, had everything shut down. My own practitioner is getting ready to retire. So now we've got to find somebody else to do the work. But I've got good news for you today. If every doctor in the world quits and every nurse walks off the job, he is still the great physician. He is still the great physician. And we may have to come to the place where this is no longer a church but a hospital to lay hands on the sick and expect them to recover. Come on, somebody give him some praise in the house. Listen, if you come up here and you want prayer and you need healing, I'm going to lay hands on you. I'm going to anoint you with oil. I'm going to call some of the people in which you have faith. And that's what he says when he called, to anoint the sick with all, call, call the elders of the church, anoint the sick with all, and the sick shall recover. Amen. Now, that wasn't a suggestion. That was God's promise. And that's going to come into fruition. There's somebody coming in. You can, you can let that young man in, if you will, uh, brother. Uh, I, I know who that is. Praise the Lord. And the sick shall recover. But the elders of the church are not those ones that have been put in position of just having the word elder attached to their name. No, sir. They are people of faith. That means anybody with enough faith. And let me tell you something. If you come up here to pray for somebody that I'm praying for, and you have any doubt in your mind, I don't want to be mean and facetious to you, but stay where you're at. I want people with faith. I want people to believe. I want people to know that the hand of God moves by the faith in which people express in their hearts. Hallelujah. God's only requirement. You know there's only one requirement for the rapture? It's not what church you go to. It's not what denomination you belong to. You're going into rapture simply because you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins and you accepted that. You're going into rapture. Because none of us deserve to go. None of us deserve anything from God. Do we not understand that God's great grace is his unmerited favor towards crippled man who could not make it on his own, so he gave his only begotten son that he so loved the world that whoever would believe in him shall have everlasting life. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, give him praise. So in this great psalm of David in 2 Samuel chapter 22, if you will give me that first verse. I backed up just a few verses uh, just to bring you back up to speed. So he begins to say like this, For thou hast girded me with strength the battle. Them that rose up against me, thou hast subdued under me. Now, every ounce of sin and every attack from the devil is always subdued by faith. It ain't a matter of fact if the devil is going to attack you, but when? Because he's always looking for a chance to discourage you to get you off track, to tell you, you don't need to go to that church. You don't need to listen to that preacher. Oh, you ain't got time for the Word of God today. You're too busy. 
and getting all these things other than what you need. Because I will tell you something right now. There is not a man-made program in the house of God that's going to do you an ounce of good to the times that are coming. You're going to have to have the Word of God to fight Satan and his demon hordes that are coming after the church. That's what Jesus defeated him with in the wilderness. That's what the church will defeat him with on this earth. Hallelujah. And he knows it. And so he devises and gets ministries to entertain instead of instruct. Now, there's nothing wrong with Christian entertainment. I love Christian entertainment. We have it here, and there's a time for it. But the main focus of the church is to insert the Word of God into one's heart, to give them a word in which David says, Thou that has girded me with strength to battle, giving him the Holy Spirit. See, you have the Holy Spirit in you, which is the most powerful weapon on the face of the earth. There is not a nuclear bomb that's ever bigger than the power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit can move mountains. Say to this mountain, Be thou removed, and shall be cast into sea. You shall not doubt in your heart. Hallelujah. Mountains, we're not talking about literal mountains. We're talking about the mountains of life. The mountains of physical problems. The mountains of spiritual problems. The mountains of financial problems. The mountains of relationship problems. There's always a mountain. But I will tell you something. God will give you the power to climb that mountain. And when you get to the top, you'll be like Moses. You'll find him. You'll find him. You'll find him real in your life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Next verse, if you will, please. Verse 41. For you have given me the necks of my enemies that I might destroy them who hate me. Listen to the footnote. Every believer is intended to be completely victorious over the world, the flesh, and the devil, and could do uh, no, nothing through, uh, and can do so through the cross and only through the cross. Now, let's go back to the teaching of the cross because it's the most important message that's ever been given in the Word of God. God gave it to, uh, to Paul. We see this. Now, now, let me say this. All the way from the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, the message of the cross has been given to us all the way through there. Jesus Christ and him sacrificed. All the way through Moses wandering in the wilderness. The entire thing of the tabernacle in the wilderness. Right down to the smallest minute. Whether it be a gold ring, brass ring, copper ring, whatever it was holding up the curtains, the colors of the curtains, the way that the, the, that the holies was designed and the holy holies of design was designed to do one thing. To express Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Amen. Hallelujah. Because the power of the cross is our power. It, it is our power and our solution to every issue and every problem and every way to sin that so easily besets you. Next verse, please. Verse 43. And I did beat them as small as dust of the earth. I did stamp them as the mire of the street. And I did spread them ab abroad. Note says, this is uh, what we do with every sin in which does so easily beset us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, if you want to see a reference to that. We are to overcome all, and nothing must overcome us, and it can be done only through the cross. You know why that got that I'm perfect today? <laughs> because of the blood of Jesus. Amen. I'm not perfect in my body, but I'm perfect in the sight of God. Because that's the only thing that he will accept is perfection. He will not accept our bumbling and stumbling and everything else that we try to do in religious realms uh, to try to impress other people and try to say, you know, that, well, I'm, I, I, you know, listen, that I am the favor of God. Let me tell you something right now. Because of the blood of Jesus, you are highly favored in the sight of God. Every one of you. Not based on what you do, based on who you believe in. If I'm going to be better, because he's going to make me better. I know my faults, and I've got tons of them, and plenty of them. And any Christian that walks around with their nose in the air and thinks that they don't, I doubt their salvation. I can't judge their heart, but I can judge your fruit. And when it's got worms in it, I ain't eating it. Amen? Amen. If I'm going to eat fruit, it's going to be good fruit, not just any fruit. And there's a lot of people who do, and it's sad. Because they're missing the blessings of God. Do you understand that those who humble themselves before the Lord, God will lift them up? God will lift them up. 
because he knows that you can handle the self-pride that lives within every human being's heart. See, I don't, I don't, how can I say this? I, I praised and worshiped God riding to church this morning. <laughs> that he would choose an old wretch like me to bring his word. To come into this house and, and I said, God, give me your anointing this morning. Give me your wisdom and your knowledge. That, Lord, something that I speak today will encourage your people, will strike them dead into their hearts, cause their lives to be changed, God. Not by the power of the church, but by the power of God. See, the church always thinks that they can change you. I can't change you, but I know the man who can. The same man that changed me. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, just ask yourself, how's my life going? I guarantee you, it ain't going good. With all your doubt and your fear and your unbelief and everything else going on, there's only one that can cure that, and that's the blood of Jesus. The face, what we're facing in this world today. Church, just look at the violence that's going on in our own communities. I mean, just in Seaford the other day, they killed somebody, set the place on fire, burned them up. In Seaford. I'm not talking about Chicago. We got gunfire going off in the city streets everywhere. There's not a street in Seaford, Delaware, or hardly in Laurel, or anywhere else that you can walk down and feel completely safe. But you're not looking over your shoulder. Sussex County in particular has a very soft, uh, uh, a, a false sense of security because we do live in a great area. That I will give you. As far as I'm concerned, there is no better place than the Eastern Shore. Hallelujah. Whether it be in Maryland, Delaware, or Virginia, there's no better place than the Eastern Shore. Listen to this. Next verse, if you will, please. Verse 44. You have, all, you have also have delivered me from the strivings of my people, and you have kept me to be the head of the heathen, and my people which I, I knew not and, and shall serve me. Now, this actually pertains, has nothing to do with David, but has everything to do with Jesus Christ and his second coming. Listen to the note. This happens with David and is a greater fulfillment awaits the greater son of David, who is Jesus, and which will take place on his second event when the entire world will serve him. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That will bring world peace. There will be no peace. There will be no serenity. There will be no stopping of war. There will be no stopping of disease. There will be no stopping of hunger or anything else in which we've already encountered. It will just get worse as we go. Oh, but the people of God, we're going to be all right. We're going to be all right. We're going to procure your people. Go ahead. Go ahead. We've came to the kingdom for such a time as this. We came and God has blessed you for one of the greatest events that history will ever record for a short period of time, and that's when the church is taken out of here by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The first time around, he sent Moses. Moses took him 40 years to get a group of people who would believe God. Now it's taken the last 2,000 years to get a group of people who believe God. But God is not going to trust this exodus in the hands of man. This exodus is going to be in the hands of Jesus Christ and him crucified. Hallelujah. It's coming, church. It's coming. I got back-to-back -back graveside funerals this week. I got one Friday and one Saturday, and I'm already praying. I'm already praying. I said, God, I don't care which day it is, but I hope I'm standing there when you come back. I'll meet my family in the air. I know where they'll be. But, 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 but when the Bible says that the dead in Christ shall rise first, I'm getting ready to see that great event. Oh, hallelujah. And they ain't coming out of them graves looking like zombies. And they ain't coming out of there looking like Halloween characters. They're coming out of there with a glorified body. Hallelujah. Drenched in the power of God and the beauty thereof. I'm like, I'm getting ready to get one of them. <laughs> I'm getting ready to get me one of them. Hallelujah. It's been years back. We had a, a, an old horse that Brother Byron helped me, helped me bury that horse. That poor old horse it, it was 42 years old when it finally passed. And uh, it was just waiting around. I thought it was waiting around for the rapture because I was going to ride it out of here. But I'm just praying God's going to resurrect him too and I'm going to be standing out there waiting to get on him. 
And if I don't get on him, I'll get on the back with Jesus. Just go ahead, Jesus. You got this thing. Right on. Hallelujah. <laughs> Give me the next verse, if you will, please. Verse 45. Strangers shall submit themselves unto me. And as soon as they hear, they shall be uh, obedient unto me. Again, it refers back to Christ. And once again, the second coming. And the whole world will, will be bowing at the feet of Christ. And it will happen. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess he is Lord. Without failure. With, absolutely without failure. Do you understand the deception in which the devil has conjured up and has not already tricked the church into it, but a whole lot of people who's called themselves Christians and got them off on a tangent and where God can't do anything because they're out of the blood of Jesus Christ, but yet they have a form of godliness and denying the power thereof. Let me tell you something right now. Without the Holy Spirit, without the power of the Holy Spirit, there is nothing going to be done in the house of God or for anybody who shows up in the house of God. It is all done through the lightning rod of the Holy Spirit by participants who will believe God will give them what they need when they need it. Can somebody help me preach up in this house? <laughs> Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Verse 46, if you will. Strangers shall fade away, and they shall be afraid. Of their close places. Christ shall rule with a great power and the strangers of his grace, and they will soon be no more. Verse 47. The Lord lives, and blessed, uh, blessed by my rock, and exalted be by God of the rock of my salvation. After the cross, it was most definitely exalted, meaning this. I exalt God every day for the sacrifice in which he has given me in order for me to have a relationship with him like I've never had a relationship with anybody else. Here's the beautiful thing about God. We can all talk to him at one time. Here's the wonderful thing about God. He can talk back to us all at one time. What gives us that ability to reach the throne of God goes back to the cross again. I am the door, and whoever enters into this gate shall find pastor, rest, relaxation, confidence, not in what this world is doing, but what God is doing. See, all of this is a plan, church. All of this is just a plan. And in 2022, we're going to vote. In 24, we're going to vote. Hopefully some things change for the better. But I will tell you something right now. If God tarries that far, and he might not, we can't vote our way out of this. But prayer and believing changes everything. Right. Hallelujah. The church can make a difference. But unbelievably, unbelievably, the church will vote just as much unrighteous as the world will. Go ahead, preacher. Go ahead, preach right there. Thank you. I think I will. I'll stay right here. Unbelievable. Now, when I say we can't vote ourselves out of this, but we can sure slow wickedness down by putting people in the right places at the right time. Now, in saying that, we must also understand that God is still in control, and he's on the throne. Give me just a minute. My imp has got a ghost in it. It's not holy. It's something else, whatever it is. Come out of there in Jesus' name. <laughs> Hallelujah. The church... Today, right now, is the only thing that's standing between the devil running over us and wiping us out and a holy God who loves us. We're standing the breach, church. Go ahead. Go ahead. Give God some praise. Not always in what we do, but in what we believe. We're the only moral standard that is left. Our schools have gone crazy. Our parents have been labeled terrorists. Can you believe this? The FBI and the DOJ is coming after you because you don't like what your kids are being taught. Listen to me, parent. www.k12.com You can put your kid online free of charge. You ain't got to have a school tell them what to do. You can do it yourself. Hallelujah. Pull them out. Two-thirds of what they teach them in there should be abuse to start with. In fact, the matter is, if they caught you teaching them of that stuff, they'd probably arrest you. This is where we have came to the moral fabric of our country. 
And the church has to make the difference. And the church has to stand up. See, I'm just fortunate that my child is 34 instead of 14. Because every week you're going to have to come bail me out of jail. Because I'm going to the school. And I'm going to knock on the door and I'm going to talk to the principal. And any time that I ever had an issue, and I've had in my time, well, let me, let me tell you this little story. In Christian school, young man, fourth or fifth grade, wasn't very old, had a pencil box. And one of the other little kids said, called him by name and said, what are you building, a bomb? And he said, yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm building a bomb. The church teacher heard him say that, took him to the principal, and the principal called the state police. And so anyway, of course, you know, you know your pastor. I don't never say much about anything. So I'm standing out in the parking lot waiting to get, uh, pick up my child. And the mother who usually parks beside me, she is tore up. She's all crying. I thought somebody died in their family. I said, what's wrong with you? She said, they called the state police on my son. I said, do what? I know the little young boy. Had him in soccer. Do what? They called the state police on my boy. He cannot come back to school till he gets a psychiatric evaluation. I said, what in the world did he do? And she told me that story. Just about that time, the principal came by. I said, hey, Hoss, come over here. Over here. You called the state police on this woman, on this woman's kid, simply because he said, yeah, I'm building the bomb. He said, well, that's what I'm required by law to do. I said, let me tell you something, Hoss. You better call more than one state trooper if you do that to my son because you're going to need him. Nobody ever called on my son. <laughs> and that's what more parents need to do. They need to stand up for their children and for their rights Amen. instead of them being put upon just like that they're just a yesterday's news and they're not. Let me tell you something right now. When you teach children right, they go right. Amen. I said when they teach children right, they go right. Amen. Thank God for our junior church. Because Wanda and them, they teach the Word of God to our children. And hopefully that will sink deep into their spirits. If you watch around this church, and, and I thank God for it, little children run up me all the time. They're they dragging on me. They're hanging on me and everything. I just, you, know, you know why? Because I stop and I pay attention to them. Because they're important. Because they're not tomorrow's church. They're today's. That's why they're here. Amen. Amen. They're today's church. Next verse, please. Verse 48. It is God who avenges me and who brings down the people under me. The believer must not take vengeance unto his own hands, but leave it to the such of the Lord. Meaning this, you and I, throughout the history of life, has had people do bad things to us. Every one of us. There's not one of us in here that's not had something done or something said or whatever the case may be behind our backs or stabbed us in the back, whatever the case may be, undermined us, Whatever, whatever the thing is. And you know what? I treat them people with as much respect as I treat my best friend. And it drives them crazy. Because that's not what they expect. They expect a fleshly reaction and something in which they, they can hold against me to say, well, and, and see, here, here's, here's the biggest excuse in the world. Well, I thought you was a Christian. Well, you're not. You know the difference between me and you? I'm going to heaven. Even with all my imperfections at this moment, I'm still going to heaven. Amen. And you're not. Amen. But you can. <laughs> we were just talking about this the other day when we, when we were traveling. It's been a long time since I've had an opportunity to do it, but I have done it. And people have just gotten, you know, almost right in your face, which we can't do that now. We have to have six foot distancing. Yeah. That's as close as you can get. And I look at them and point my finger right in their face. I said, you know what you can do for me? You can go right straight to heaven. And they're like, what'd you say? <laughs> That's what they, they weren't expecting that. See, when you let God have vengeance, God will take vengeance on those who need to have vengeance on. It's his job. He'll take care of them. They'll be a miserable wreck. But you know what my obligation is? 
is to pray for them. Jesus said in the Beatitudes, pray for them who spitefully use you, who lie about you, who do all these other crazy things. He said, pray for them. I pray for them, Pastor. I pray for fire, fall down on their head, burn them right up into a pile of ashes. <laughs> burn them, Lord! <laughs> no. No, your prayer should be, God, save their souls. Open up their eyes. Let them see what I see. Let them feel what I feel. See, people who are not born again don't see what you see. People who are not born again, they don't feel what you feel. People that, you're, that are not born again, they don't have the revelation of the Holy Spirit and the guidance in which he gives us. Now, that's not to say that, you know, that you and I, as Christians, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to flounder. We're, we're going to say things sometimes that's inappropriate. Welcome to the world of the flesh. But it's not something in which we practice. See, back in the day, I practiced sin. In fact, I was perfected at it. I was good. I was a master at sin when it came to drinking and smoking and cussing and running around and tripping over my cords. And I was a master at it. But then when I accepted Jesus, all of that moved. Not only did I not have a desire for it anymore, I don't want anything to do with it. But yet that does not mean that my flesh is perfected or perfect in any way, nor will it ever be until we go on to be with the Lord. You're not going to have a perfect body until your body becomes glorified and or a spiritual body, whichever comes first. Amen. And those of you that go before the rapture, you get a double dose. You get a spiritual body and a glorified. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Next verse, please. Verse 49. And who brings me forth? My enemies, and you also have lifted me up high and above those who uh, uh, rose up against me. You have delivered me from the violent man. As David was delivered from Saul and delivered from the powers of darkness, but only as our faith is in place in Jesus Christ and the cross, can we ever begin to understand the freedom from sin. See, when I fail and I go to God, I say, God, help me. You know, that, that song that we sing, I, I have so much trouble when I, when I sing, help me because it, it just, it really does, it, it affects me emotionally, and I have everything I do can keep, to com keep my composure as I'm singing that song, because this is a song in which I, I sing to God all the time, God help me, fix me Lord, because I can't fix myself, I'm not what I, I, I want to be, but thank God I ain't what I used to be, Amen. hallelujah, getting better by the day, huh, getting better by the day, why, because God, has put the enemy of sin under my feet because of the blood of Jesus. Amen. And it's hard for us, I understand this, it's hard for me, even as your pastor, to comprehend that God looks down on me at a daily basis and deems me perfection. Because what he sees is not me, what he sees is the sacrifice of his son. What he sees today is Jesus Christ sitting at his right hand. And because Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, he never has to speak a word. Just his very presence speaks salvation. Salvation for the world. You know, I've heard sermons that Jesus uh, pleads our case night and day. Yes, he does, but he doesn't do it uh, verbally. He does it physically by just being there. Because if he wasn't there, then what he did on Calvary's cross was not sufficient. God did not accept it, and there'd be a body in the tomb over in Jerusalem. Right. But I don't care how many millions and millions of people has been to that tomb. They ain't never found a body because that body's coming back on a white horse to get that which is his. Hallelujah. And you and I are one of them. Not because of what we do, but because of what we believe. Amen. It's liberating. It's absolutely liberating liberating you know for years of my life I knew I was saved and there was no doubt about it and I knew I was going to heaven but there was this great fear in which I had to deal with all the time of doing something wrong not realizing that outside of the blood of Jesus I was wrong anyway I'd been somewhat adapted to performance 
that you had to go to church so many times a week and you had to you know, pray so many hours a day and you had to read the Word of God so many hours a day. And all of those are good things. Put in the right context. Because out of context, they become drudgery. Because you've made a religion out of it instead of relationship. Oh, there's a big difference. Like, ah, uh, what time is it? I can sleep 15 more minutes. Pastor Joe ain't going to get in the pulpit before 1030. If I don't show up before 11 o'clock, I'll be good. Hallelujah. Whatever. Can. See, that's, that's drudgery. David said, it is good to go to the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. And I can tell by the enthusiasm of the people in here this morning, that's what you felt like when you came in. It is good to go into the house of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Listen, you, you, can, you can watch us on TV, and as handsome as I am, it ain't going to help you like the house of God. It, it is there for a purpose. It is there for those in whom, for whatever reason, can't get to church, who want to go back a week from now and see what was preached and hopefully get something out of it. And all of that is good. And I thank God for it because it helped us tremendously during the pandemic. Do you know how much anointing you need from God to come in and preach on a Sunday morning and there's nobody in the building? In fact, somebody had a good idea. They didn't carry it through. They said, we're going to make some cardboard cutouts and put them in the seats. <laughs> and I thought to myself, can you move their mouth and say amen once in a while? <laughs> It was difficult, church, but God gave me and gave you what you needed when you did. That's the kind of God we serve. You can't stop God. A pandemic cannot stop God. A pandemic cannot stop the Word of God. I don't care if I had to stand out here and preach with a bullhorn. I was going to show up on Sunday and preach. A lot of churches shut down. They didn't have the availability or the technical technology in order to get out of their walls. And tell you the truth, we didn't either. And God saw something coming that we didn't see coming. We got this urge. We, we, got, we, got, to, we, got, to get, we got to be able to get out of sight of these walls. We got to get on YouTube and Facebook. And thank God, you know, he, he sent us some people who had the techn uh, technologically skills in order to do that. And, and, and it's, it, it's worked fantastic. Listen, we got people in Texas. We, 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 got, we got people in, in Wisconsin. Hallelujah. We got people in Jersey, Pennsylvania that contact us all the time and say, keep preaching, preacher. I said, I will. Amen. Hallelujah. Listen to this. Next verse, please. Therefore, I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord. Among the heathen will I sing praises to, unto thy name. Now, there is no greater power that a one person can do, whether it be a good day or bad day or indifferent, than to praise the Lord. Amen. There is power in praise. And when you put it in one corporate area and everybody praises the Lord, let, let, me, let me set the record straight here. It ain't your job to sing the song. That's my job. Your job is to praise God in the song. Amen. You can sing it if you want to. But we need to set an atmosphere of praise and worship. Because you can't worship unless you know how to praise. Amen. Because praise slips in to worship. It's like a high and low gear. You start off in low gear. And then all of a sudden it shifts to high gear. And the Spirit of God begins to fall and develop a place and a people. And the praise blaze loose. Your confidence in God is raised through praise and worship. And like I said, it's okay to sing the song. But let me go back into the world here for a minute. Back when half of you were dancing to where I was playing, you wasn't singing the song. You were just dancing. You didn't even know the words to the song. All you wanted was a beat. Something you could jiggle to. And the more you drank, the better you thought you danced. You didn't. <laughs> uh-uh. You didn't. Have you ever seen people try to disco that he stopped loving her today? It don't work. 
<laughs> it don't work. But you know what the Holy Ghost will do? He'll do something to Jack and Jim Beam can't. He can get you so intoxicated on his spirit that everybody in the house looks good. Do you hear what I'm saying? You'll fall right in love with everybody. Hallelujah. Give you a given spirit. Give you a cheerful heart. Lord knows we need a cheerful heart in the days that we live in. Look, the things that I look at sometimes on this phone, I just laugh at it. Go, go ahead, devil. You ain't going to win. It ain't going to happen. You can do all of that if you want to. Let me tell you something right now. The demonic forces of hell has overrun Washington, D.C. There's no two ways about it. But I got good news for you. I don't care who's sitting in the White House. I know the man who's sitting on the white throne. I know the man who's sitting on the white throne. They're going to come. They're going to go. But he's going to be here forever. Amen. And that's never going to change. Hallelujah. Therefore, I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and I will sing praises unto thy name. You know, like it's going to the corporate coffee pot tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock when you go to work, and you're like, praise Jesus, hallelujah. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. And, of course, your coworkers, they've been off all weekend drinking and everything. They all hung over, broke, sick, and everything else. They go, what is wrong with these people? Stop singing. Stop singing. Stop, and, you know, praise Jesus, hallelujah. Like, what's wrong with these people? Why are they always happy? But we got something to be happy about. Amen. I sing because... I'm happy, hallelujah. <laughs> I sing because I'm saved. I just love to praise God. Amen. Every day of my life. I spend a lot of alone time being here, being there, sometimes on the phone, sometimes in prayer. And there's not a day that all day long me and God's not having conversation. Not a day, not a time in my life since I've been saved, should I say, I've never been alone. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. They prepare the table before me in the presence of my enemies. They anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I do dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Why? Because he dwells in me. Amen. Well, you know God's dead. Well, you better tell her that person's living in me. Because he don't know it. He's still alive. Amen. I talked to him this morning. He said, go preach, Joe. I said, I'm going, Pre I'm going. I'm going right now. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Listen to this last verse that I want to do here. And I want to pick up in another psalm. And the thought that goes on with what David was saying. Verse 51. He is the tower of my salvation. For his king has showed mercy unto his anointed. Unto David and to his seed forevermore. Speaks of David and more particularly the son of David. Psalms 28 if you will. This was a psalm of David. This is a prayer for God's help. Now, if I don't get through this today, uh, I, I, I will probably go on to something else next week because I've rode this horse quite a ways. But the things in which God has tried to or has instructed me to do is to bring things that are encouraging because we deal with discouragement all week long. Yeah. All week long. And sad to say that a lot of those discouragements are not going to go away anytime soon. So what did David do in order to bring his spirits up? He would write a psalm. I'm sure, and we don't see it, but I, I feel quite confident that David would go to God and he said, God, give me a new song. Give me a song to sing, Lord. Because David went through some traumatic experiences. From his earliest of childhood, he had to kill the bear and the lion to save his own flock. Then it wasn't long after that, God thrusted him into the forefront, and Goliath was standing in his way. See, the bear and the lion always represents the sins in our life that don't seem to go away and they seem to be more powerful than we are. But David said, I slew them with my bare hands. That that power in which God gave him was 
above anything that could ever be given by the hand of man. Then David looked at Goliath, did not view him as a giant, but just another victory in God. Hallelujah. God always gives his children victory to encourage them that he is still on the throne, that he is in control of your life and my life. There's nothing that I really fear. There's things that I respect. I respect the COVID because it has brought devastation on a lot of families. And it brought us to a place of wondering where God is at. God hadn't left. COVID just another giant for David to face. And we'll face it the same way David faced it, by faith. Amen. By faith. Amen. That is the only way that you, can fa- that you can face these cares of life. So it wasn't long after he took him out, then he had to deal with Saul. Saul was after to kill him. Saul was not the chosen king of God. He was the appointed king of man. God warned them, if you appoint this man in that position, I'll allow you to do it. See, this is why the Bible is not against voting. I, I, know, I know religious, I know uh, 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 denominational uh, so-called churches who won't let their people uh, vote. No, voting's a sin. Find that in the Bible. Thou shall not vote. I haven't found that. Because he allowed the people of Israel to vote Saul in. But he told them through the prophet Samuel, he said, Samuel, you tell them he's going to take everything they got. Sooner or later, he's going to end up with all their animals and everything else, and he's going to be a dictator. We want a king. Well, that's what they hollered in the last election. We want a king. You got one. We don't know where the queen's at. She's flying around all around the world. We don't know where she's at. You want to see my impersonation of Kamala Harris? The world's going to hell. (laughs) That's her answer for everything. Help us, Lord. (laughs) Psalms 28 and verse 1. Psalms 28 verse 1 says, Unto you will I cry, O Lord, my rock. Be not silent to me. Least if you be silent to me, become like who go down unto the pit. Now, I need to give you the footnote because it is a little confusing, but the note, uh, you know, spells it right out. This is a prayer of David, and more uh, importantly, a prayer of the son of David, talking about Jesus, and again, the intercessor of our part, which comfort and is to feel the heart throb of his uh, position as he becomes one with us. So you have to understand something. Because you accepted Jesus, God views you, you and Jesus, as one. Because he's your substitute. He is what you could not be. He is what you could not do. He is what you could not overcome. He is the one in whom healeth you, who deliver you, who blesses you every day of your life. You are as one. Can somebody praise him in this house? Verse 2, please. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry unto you, when I lift up my hands towards your holy oracle. Now, in the Old Testament, the Holy Oracle was the most holy place in which contained the Ark of the Covenant and where God dwelt between the mercy seat and the cherubims. And under the New Covenant, we are to petition the Father in heaven in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the tabernacle in the wilderness, there was things that had to happen for the priest to be able to enter in to not only the holy, but the holies of holies. Now, they went into the holy room every day. And the lamb that was brought to the sacrifice, it was gruesome, church. It was absolutely a forerunner of the gruesome punishment that Jesus would take on our part. Think about this. I have a kind, kind heart when it comes to animals. I put up with some of you for a long time. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) I'm just kidding. I'm just playing. My grandmother got me on one of those jokes one time. It devastated me for half of my life. 
She said, Joseph, do you believe being kind to animals? I said, sure, Grandma. She said, well, why don't you give the monkey back his face? And I'm like, what? What? Grandma, you both love me. <laughs> I never forgot that. I was just, I was just a little kid. <laughs> Devastated me. But think about this. Poor little lamb. Let me get you back. Let me, I'll get you back. Serious, serious face. Come on. Serious face. Poor little lamb, done nothing, just showed up. And he had to slit his throat. That blood had to go into a basin because that blood was going to become important. Then that poor little lamb had his hide split down the back and pulled away. And every inch of that lamb could not be without spot or blemish. It had to be perfection. Now, that is the miracle of the hand of God when it comes to the sacrifice. There's nothing on the face of this earth that is perfected. But yet every lamb that was brought to God for sacrifice was perfected, was perfect. And that is a forerunner of what you and I are because we're now perfect in the sight of God. Then that lamb had to be put on the burnt altar. And it had to be absolutely consumed till there wasn't nothing but ashes and coal left in the bottom of that burning altar. Then those coals were taken and they were put at the altar of incense in front of the gateway of the holies of holies and that curtain that divided unholy man and a holy God. There was a special mixture in which the Bible never recorded that was poured on those hot coals from that fire. Now, that fire had to come from that particular pit. It could not come from anywhere else. We see it in the Bible where they brought strange fire to God and both of them died. And rightly so. And that oil that was poured on to those coals was a sweet-smelling Savior in the nostrils of God because it represented the intercessory prayers in which Jesus had not only prayed here on earth, but is visibly doing now in heaven. There's a lot more to the tabernacle than what you can imagine. And it's absolutely just, if you begin to study, and I will tell you, if you go back to the book of Exodus, get you a Spouser Study Bible. I'll give you one free of charge. You can read it with the notes and understand that God has always intended to have relationship with man. And he's not done yet, church. Amen. As I told you, in Sussex County, it's just going to get gooder and gooder. <laughs> Listen to this. Verse 3, if you will. Draw me not away with the wicked, and the workers of iniquity, who speak peace unto their neighbors, but mischief into their hearts. Now, verses 1 and 2 proclaim that the great chism uh, that divides the child of God from the wickedness, in which described in verses 3 and 5, in which we're just getting ready to get to, the wicked actually love their sin because the mistress is in their hearts. I, I understand this. I understand this completely. Because when I lived back in the world, I loved my sin. I loved everything that I was doing. I was dying, going to hell as fast as you unlock wheels of time were turning, but I was having fun doing it. Yeehaw! I mean, I was on a grease skateboard, headed downhill, as fast as the unlocked wheels of time would turn. And then God snatched me out of there. And it was like a reality check. He said, let me show you what real life is about. Take on my son Jesus. It's almost like God said, I dare you. I just dare you to get saved. I'll show you, God. <laughs> no, he showed me and been showing me ever since. And I thank God for every moment that I've ever been saved under the blood of the Lamb. Amen. I've never missed nothing of the world. Never missed nothing of the world. Next verse, if you will, please. Verse 4. Give them accordingly to their deeds and accordingly to their wickedness of their uh, evil doers. Give them uh, after the work of their hands and render them in, in their desert. This simply means this. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And if one thing that you can take from it is this. If you live like hell, you'll go to hell. If you live for the Lord, you're going to heaven. Amen. It's a simple process. A very simple process. You say, well, I, I like my life like it is. Well, you ain't tried this one yet. You don't know that yet. Right. The fact of the matter is, I'll do what God did. I dare you to get saved. 
I dare you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior deep into your heart. Come back here three weeks from now and tell me this is the worst thing you've ever done because it won't be. Because my God reigns. Next verse, please. Because they regard not the works of the Lord, nor the operation of His hands, and He will destroy them and not build them up. They're headed for destruction. Living outside of God does not bring anybody anything but destruction. And most of you are a first-hand witness of that, just like I was. A first-hand witness. Let me tell you this. You don't know how to have a man and wife relationship if Jesus is not the center point of it. Amen. Right. Oh, and I done got into something now. Go ahead. Stepped all in it. Both feet. I did not know how to love my wife until I learned the love of God. I did not know how to love others until I learned the love of God. I didn't know what it meant to love them who hated you. <laughs> it's a weird case. I've made mention of it before, but it is God exploded in my spirit again. There were Christians of the, uh, that, that before I got saved that were in periodically in my life, in and out, whatever the case may be. And they could not stand me when I was a sinner. But they hated me when I became a saint. I'm like, what? Oh, yeah. They couldn't stand me when I was just an old drunk. But they hated me after I became a saint. You know what it was? Jealousy. Simple, pure, prideful jealousy. Because they could relish in the fact that before I got saved, I'm better than he is because they're going to hell. How dare us to take that kind of attitude with anything or anybody? We're here to save the world. We're here to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to a hurting, dark, dying world. And if the church doesn't do it, who's going to? Who's going to, church? Who's going to take that to them? Listen to this. Verse 6. Blessed be the Lord, because he had heard the voice of my supplication. Now, it's kind of a lengthy footnote here, but it bears reading. We've got a few minutes. Now Christ, as our great high priest, in the perfection of faith, in which he is the author and the finisher, by declaring his supplication have been heard, God always hears the intercession of the great intercessor, the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 2, we have the position uh, that God will hear our, the supplication. In verse 6, we have the insurance that he has heard the supplication. And for all time, and while Christ, now beside the Father, is making intercession for us, the intercession that he has made, and the stand in the time of eternity, and is found in these psalms. And in fact, no other intercession is needed. So we vary in the presence of the throne of God, mean that he and the intercessor have been accepted, and which means it is his finished work. Amen. You know what the finished work of Christ is? There ain't nothing else I can do but accept what he's done. Amen. Nothing else is going to change me but that. And because my faith in that right there, my faith in what Jesus has done, has revolutionized my life and changed everything about me. It will change everything about you. But we cannot be changed by what we do, where we go, how we handle things. We can only be changed by the power of God of what we believe in. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, come on, come on. A couple more verses here, verse 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in Him. And I am helped, therefore... And my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song, I will praise him. Amen. With my song, I will praise him. Amen. It ain't always a song that you sing off the radio. Nope. It's what God puts in your heart. Amen. <laughs> I got a song that the angels can't sing. 
redeem my soul, redeem. You know, you're the only thing that's ever been redeemed. Angels can't sing. It's a song of truth, Lord, and victory. Redeem my soul, redeem. Ho, 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 ha, I've been bought by the blood, O oh, of the Lamb. See, you sing songs like that, you'd be like, whoo. It'll do for you what cocaine can't do. It'll do for you what liquor can't do. It'll do for you what, what, anything that's out there in the world. That they ain't got it. God's got it. Amen. I said, God's got it. Amen. He got your next fix. I tell drug addicts all the time, if you, if you want, you got, you got to get addicted to Jesus as you had the drug. Get your fix from the Holy Ghost. I ain't got much joy in my life. Then you need some Holy Ghost. He'll give you joy, unspeakable joy. He'll give you hope where there's no hope. He'll give you light where there's darkness. He'll give you love for the loveless. He'll give you peace where there is no peace. He'll give you hope for the hopeless. Somebody help me preach it in here. Hang on, two more verses and we're going to be done. Musicians, you can come on back if you will. The Lord is their strength, and he is the saving strength of his anointed. This passage declares the Trinity. He who anoints is God the Father. He who is anointed is God the Son. And the oil in which is anointed is symbolic of God, the Holy Ghost. Amen. People say, well, you can't understand the Trinity. Well, you need to get saved and you will. I experience God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit every day of my life. Amen. Every day of my life. God has made you a triunal being. You are body, soul, and spirit. Amen. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three very different when I say different, particular jobs in which they do, but they are so in oneness that you cannot tell them apart. That's why they said he is three in one. And the church needs to come to that oneness. Oneness of heart, body, mind, and soul. You're not here to get your way in the house of God, and neither am I. We are here to do one thing. To lift up the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Amen. That's what we're here to do. Last verse. Save your people. Bless your inheritance. Feed them also. And lift them up forever. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I am lifted high in the Lord today, church. Amen. I'm going to be lifted high in the church uh, today, tomorrow. Because God is with me. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's stand in the house of God today. Whatever situation you have, please come today. Please come, bring it to the Lord. This is the greatest time that you have as a people of God. is to bring your cares, frustrations, problems, whatever the case may be, God is here to do what he needs to do. He's just waiting for you to step out in faith and do what you need to do. Thank you, Lord. Oh, it was amazing grace, how sweet, sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, oh, but now I'm found. I was blind. Oh, but now I see When we've been there Ten thousand years Bright and shining as the sun We knew last day sing God's praise then when we first begun help me praise it church here we go praise God praise God praise God praise 
God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. It was amazing grace, how sweet, sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once, well, I was lost, but thank God now I'm found. I was blind. See. Church, we were blind, but thank God for the blood. Now we see. Lord, we thank you so much for the time you have given us in this church. It has been a wonderful morning in you, but the day's not over. Because, Lord, it just gets greater from here on out. Lord, I thank you for the people that's gathered around this altar and throughout this sanctuary to glorify and to praise you, Lord. Father, encourage the hearts of your people. Father, rain down on them like no other, Lord. Father, let us be that light in a darkened time because, God, you are light and you are love and you are joy, peace, hope, and comfort, God. So we thank you, Father, for this day you have blessed us with. It's the greatest day we have outside of your gates, and we're going to glorify you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give God some praise. Tell somebody you love them before you leave. I'll see you all 6 o'clock tonight.